Welcome to today's session, which is all about preparing files to migrate to Microsoft 365. Uh, my name is Dougie, uh, and I've got with me my colleague Hugh Valentine as well. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all on our webinar. Um, so today's agenda, um, we're going to be talking a bit about uh, building out a Microsoft 365 um, intranet. Um, we're going to be talking about the different approaches to take when looking at migrations, as well as creating a plan uh, and cleansing folders. Um, so today's takeaways is it's going to be what is the best migration approach for your organization? So depending on your scenario, what is going to be the best approach? Um, how you should plan your migration uh, and know how to cleanse your files. We're also going to give you 10 insider tips from years of experience um, that we've had at Valto delivering migration projects. So first of all, building an intranet with Microsoft 365. Um, so there's a core different elements to this. We've got SharePoint, which is the document storage and intranet. Um, and before migrating, you need to consider your internet structure. So in terms of SharePoint and Teams, we're going to come on to talking a bit about the different types of SharePoint sites in a moment. Um, it's important to understand the types of SharePoint sites so that you know how many you're going to need of communication sites, team sites, and what the hub sites have um, in terms of their features, which connects all of this together. So before we jump into the, the, those different areas, Let's talk a little bit about what the different products that are often involved in a migration are. So um, we've got SharePoint, OneDrive and Teams. Now SharePoint is a company wide product uh, which is all about creating publishing portals that the whole company can access. Um, from a sharing perspective, this is generally open to all staff. So everybody has read access, but only a handful of people that would have editorial access. Um, an example on internet including news, policies and departments for publishing information. Whereas OneDrive is your personal document storage space and we would recommend that people do take full advantage of OneDrive because everybody would on average get about a terabyte's worth of storage space. Um, from a sharing perspective, this is usually on an ad hoc kind of basis. So most documents inside your OneDrive you would be only working on yourself, but you can choose to share them out. And quite often when you're dipping your toe into this kind of external sharing of documents, it's quite often that the OneDrive is the first area that you enable for external sharing to mitigate any risk of documents falling into the wrong hands. We've then got the Teams areas, which is specifically for departments or potentially projects or other type of collaborational purposes inside of the organization. Teams is a collaboration tool where multiple people can work in a modern way. For example, you can invite your departments to share files and join meetings, uh, create teams for new projects to store all your relevant information. And again, from a sharing perspective, this is all about inviting the group of users you're working with, including external parties as well. So you can have external facing teams to help build out that collaboration. So what's the role of the SharePoint hub site? So when we're thinking about this architecture, the SharePoint hub site um, is essentially the top layer. Now, if you're familiar with kind of classic SharePoint, you'll be aware that there used to be this approach of having a web application, and then you'd have a top level site, which had sub sites which sit underneath it. And this was a very stringent kind of very sort of stacked way that you couldn't change. Once a subsite was underneath a certain uh, top level site, you couldn't change it and it could cause a lot of issues and permissions could end up getting quite sort of um, complicated. Whereas with the new modern structure, the way it works is that you have these communication and team sites, uh, which are almost like islands. So if, if you think about your hub site being the middle, which connects everything together, they all kind of sit independently, but are connected to the hub site. So they're all associated to the hub site and sites can easily associate to different hub sites if needs be, but most organizations would only have one hub site. Um, you could potentially have multiple hub sites, say for example, if you had an organization which had um, multiple different locations around the world, you might have a hub site um, per kind of say, one for the sort of US, one for kind of Europe, one for Asia, um, and because it might be different content, different sort of navigations, uh, maybe even different branding as well, if it was a kind of umbra umbrella type of company. Um, but as I say, um, th the purpose of the hub sites um, is that you can do things like inheriting permissions. You can inherit the branding, so the colors and the themes and that sort of stuff, uh, as well as most importantly, the navigation that runs throughout, so keep it consistent. And this can be like a mega menu navigation as well, which has drop downs. 
it's also about uh, not only pushing sort of things downwards, but also pulling things up as well. So rolling up things like news articles, which are created on these teams and communication sites uh, and pulling them up. Same with the documents and overall kind of activity. So this is a, a bit of an example of what a modern day hub site would kind of look like. You can see across the top, we've got a, a navigation um, bar. We've got some news areas, which is pulling from multiple areas. We can embed things like this is actually a PDF, but it could be a Power BI report. So if you're using Power BI dashboards, we can easily embed them into modern SharePoint home pages as well. Um, events, again, we can roll these up from multiple areas. So you think about your hub site being almost like the home page, the landing point for your internet, and then you're pulling out all this content and rolling up into one centralized place. We can do things like embedding um, Canvas Power Apps as well. Um, so there might be things like creating requests. I know we've we've done a lot of things with like Teams request apps before and embedding those directly into SharePoint. And then again, quick links, useful links and useful contacts as well. So then what are team sites? So team sites are essentially um, uh, what are the back end of a Microsoft team? So we all kind of know what Microsoft Teams are for collaboration, but in terms of the actual SharePoint side of it, what often people don't realize is that every time you create a Microsoft team, you're also creating a SharePoint team site. Now this is storage for your kind of day-to-day -day files, either through the SharePoint interface or through the Microsoft Teams interface. It's all really about collaborating with your team. So let's say, for example, uh, a sales team, um, they are going to have a team site where they're, they're working together, collaborating, sharing kind of documents, proposals and things like that. Um, collaborating uh, with, with the team. So in terms of this, we, we've also got the Microsoft Teams end and we've also got the SharePoint uh, interface. You can have useful links in the same way we can have pages, news articles, things like that, which can all roll up onto the hub site. Uh, and team sites have their navigation across the left hand side. So sometimes as, as a quick way of sort of telling the difference between sites is where the navigation is placed. So the next thing we're going to be talking about is a communication sites which have their navigation across the top, whereas a team site has their navigation across the left hand side. Usually there's one team site per department. So you can imagine things like marketing, sales, IT, um, finance, HR. They would all have their own team sites for their day to day collaborational purposes. So this is a Microsoft team, so you can imagine here we've got uh, strategy and planning, which is the front end of the Microsoft team, but also in the background, if you went to the files, you'd have an opening SharePoint button. So there's a SharePoint site, which is directly um, sort of relevant to this particular team. So then the next thing is the SharePoint communication sites. So this is a direct replacement for what was used to be called publishing sites. And actually, um, communication sites are all about communicating information to the, to the wider company. So if we think about the example we were looking at before with a sales team, where they have a, a, an internal sort of team where they're collaborating with their own team members, they might also have a communication site for giving out other information to the wider organization um, for people to say sales figures and things like that. Um, it might be, say, for example, finance team. They have a finance team site um, where they can have um, their, their own sort of collaboration, sharing spreadsheets, things like that. But they also have a finance communication site where they're offering services and documents to the wider organization, things like expense request forms and, and budgetary kind of information. Same with HR, internal team for them, and maybe they've got a HR communication site where they're publishing policies and documents and things like that. So um, the, the key thing about this though is that a communication site is not directly linked to a Microsoft team. They're a standalone independent site, and it might be that you have it a, uh, titled after a department or a business unit, um, but it could be something completely different. You might just have a communication site called policies and procedures, and actually there's multiple departments which go in there. So typically with a communication site, it's not everybody from that department have editorial access to it. There's only a handful of people, super users, that would be going on there. And it's not content which is changing all that often either. It's usually just things which, are, as I say, as a communicating, publishing platform for that department to give information to the wider business. This is a standard kind of communication site. Again, we can have things like news, events, quick links, um, and basically tying together all the things that we want to publish um, and show to the wider organization. Then the final kind of product, which you need to kind of be aware of when considering your migration into Microsoft 365 is OneDrive. So OneDrive is your personal storage area. 
um, and it's not related directly to the internet. You have up to a terabyte of um, data per employee. So that's why we say it really is worth thinking about this because you think about if you are, say, on average, at a 200 uh, sort of employee organization, on average, you might have, uh, say, one or two terabytes worth of SharePoint and team storage space combined at all of your teams, all your SharePoint sites in one. Whereas actually you've got a potential of 200 terabytes of OneDrive storage space because everybody's got that, that, that kind of there. So it's worth tapping into making sure that relevant documents are living in the right place. So on average, all SharePoint and team sites, as I say, combined store uh, are a couple of terabytes. Um, you could potentially even consider having service accounts and using those OneDrives as well. So sometimes there's like an archiving thing as part of this kind of migration is thinking about having a service account where you might want to lift and shift some documents which you want to keep, but you're not going to access all that often. So you could potentially use that OneDrive space there as well. You can share documents or move them into SharePoint team sites at any time as well. So you could be working on OneDrive as your kind of main kind of area that you're creating drafts and first versions of documents um, and then you can actually move them directly from uh, OneDrive into SharePoint or Teams um, and it can be open for external sharing as well to avert, uh, avoid uh, use for the third party things like Dropbox, Google Drive, things like that. Often OneDrive as I was saying before is the first thing which is opened up for external sharing so that people can share out documents um, outside of the organization. So then that brings on to actually the types of migration. So again, before you start thinking about how the migration is going to work, there's the, you need to consider what's the, the best kind of approach, what's the type of migration which is going to fit your scenario. So although you can take different elements of these different things, I've tried to boil these down to three core areas. So we've got what I call a lift and shift approach, which is essentially migrating everything as it is currently as it stands. So the pros of this is that it's quick and there's no input from users. So it's literally just moving it from point A to point B without any kind of changes. Um, so the cons of this is that actually you're migrating redundant files and there's no opportunity to improve anything. So if there was loads of kind of folder structures which don't make any sense anymore, um, or, or there's things with documents you just don't need to touch anymore, you're moving that and you're making a bigger job for yourself potentially. So the tips around this is only attempt this if you either have um, a very efficient folder structure, which in my experience, I've, I've never really seen many organizations which truly have an efficient folder structure that have been going for a, a number of years. Um, and, and everybody usually has um, plenty of ways that they could make their folder structures more efficient. Or you have no choice basically, but to move as a lift and shift. So maybe there's a critical time limit such as failing hardware or software license renewal for a sort of different third party product, which is up and you basically you need to move quickly. So that's really the only times so it's, it's worth thinking about. And then even then, once you have come across into team SharePoint OneDrive, it's still worth going through that process of cleansing and reviewing everything. The second option is users as and when. So basically this is where you let the users move files manually across into new SharePoint Teams area. So it might be that you do create the SharePoint site, you create the Teams, but well then you're allowing the users to move across. Now this is usually done by putting the old, say, file server into read-only mode, um, and then when people are using the, the sort of documents as and when, they move them across themselves into the relevant areas. So the pros of this is it gets people using the products quicker and learning by doing so throw people into the deep end, get them used to it. Um, whereas the cons are that the time required from all, it basically requires time from all the staff um, and there's potential for duplication risks um, and organically growing a very messy structure because although you're allowing them to start again, there's no real control um, over um, a, a, that particular process. So tips around this only attempt if you want to adopt Microsoft 365 quickly, but do not have a reason to decommission old document storage within, say, a 12 month period um, and, and saving money on the overall migration. So um, it, it's something that if you if you've got either a very small uh, IT department or a very small budget for the migration, it's a way of offloading that kind of resource time um, and spreading it throughout the organization. And the third option, which is our preferred option, is the managed new structure approach. So this is carefully planning a new structure that represents the, the key business functions. Um, so as I said before, having a communication site for like a finance, a communication site for uh, HR and things like that, IT, and then having a Microsoft team for each one of those uh, particular sections as well and working in a very managed way to figure out what the new structure is going to look like, um, spending time cleansing documents, things like that.
So the pros of taking this more managed approach is there's more structure. Uh, it's more efficient um, in the sort of the long run because we're not sort of dragging this this sort of process out. It's a kind of middle ground between rushing it and and uh, and sort of doing the user as and when, which can take a lot longer. Um, and there's less overall impact on end users because we're not relying on them so much. Um, we will want some level of commitment from them, um, but only in small kind of bursts for them to sort of cleanse their documents and work with us to build out that new kind of folder structure. And it's an opportunity to refresh old ways of working. So looking at things thinking, actually, this makes no sense anymore, or the folder structure is no longer efficient, or we've got duplications, let's tidy it up. The cons are it requires more time to kind of plan. So it front loads the migration where most of the migration actually is all in the planning phase, the design, creating the kind of um, the, the we're talking about going to talk about site map shortly about how we structure all of that and plan that out. And that's where the time comes in. So the tips are this is our preferred method. So where possible, this is the way that you would like to go. So a very important thing around this is actually then getting the buy in um, from um, the, the, the actual sort of departments before you kind of go down this route. Um, so the hardest challenge for migration is actually getting the key stakeholders to commit to the project and you can only really do that if you can get sort of buy-in from them so they're bought into why we're doing this um quite often there's a, this idea of everyone is sort of too busy right now to, to sort of work on this um whereas actually if they bought into this and got things moving there'd be so many so much time saving and efficiencies um that it would actually make their lives a lot easier Often the concept of change is scary to some, so actually giving them a really good demonstration about how SharePoint works, how Teams works, how OneDrive works, and all the additional features and benefits they're going to get from using this to get them to buy into it is critical. Um, so when a well so delivered demonstration and presentation will assist that buy in. Um, we need to almost sell the vision of why we're doing this to the rest of the organization. Often they'll just kind of think, oh, this is just something IT are doing and it's not really relevant to us or it's not going to make much difference. So it's really a part of that kind of overall process is to get them to buy in. Um, so below is actually a little snippet from the, the type of workshop we run. So we do offer a service uh, of running file migration readiness workshops and as part of that we spend time specifically talking to people and showing them SharePoint how they're accessing files from different areas from a browser syncing documents so you can actually access them offline how you can access the documents directly through the Microsoft Teams interface the mobile applications you can have for SharePoint and Teams as well as additional features that often people aren't even aware of things like version history so you can actually go back and see who's changed the documents and when even restore a document back from a previous version if you realize it's gone a bit pear-shaped um, real-time collaboration so what we call co-authoring where multiple people can edit the same document at the same time and sharing documents as well so I was saying before sharing them internally with links directly to a document so you don't end up with duplications or emails um, with sort of attachments being lost and people turning up to the wrong meeting with the wrong document you can mitigate all of that with the sharing features that come with SharePoint and Teams and overall SharePoint being a content management system above all um, you've got all the kind of comms kind of benefits and news and, um, and and having that kind of publishing portal where everyone knows this kind of single source of truth approach where you just know that this is where you go to get your latest kind of information. Um, I guess the main uh, the main piece around doing this getting the buy-in is we don't want to just do a simple lift and shift for Microsoft 365 and take a file server and move it into 365. Mm -hmm. This is a huge opportunity to actually change the way people are working, get them bought into hybrid working, using Microsoft Teams for collaboration. There's a huge host of security benefits that we can do with things like sensitivity labels, retention can help with automation of GDPR type processes. So by doing this demonstration in the first instance, we're getting buy-in from the organization that when we need to, to do some of the next steps, which is cleansing, helping us with the archive, this is kind of switching them on. So actually this isn't just moving files from A to B, this is going to give us a lot of value and then they're going to more likely to be able to help us with what we need to do in the next stages. Exactly, yeah. and and. and a lot of people undervalue that kind of step, but it really is going to pay dividends over the project if you get that buy-in at the first stage. So the next step is then creating your plan. So you've gathered your stakeholders, 
from IT, heads of department, super users, which are going to um, get more involved. Um, you're then going to look at choosing your migration type. So based on what we were just talking about before, you're going to look at what is the best migration type. So dependence on your requirements will depend on which of those kind of three options we were talking about before. Quite often at this stage, it's it's useful to engage a Microsoft partner. Obviously, this is optional, but Val to offer fully managed migration services or an ad hoc support service to bridge any knowledge gaps that you might have um, around SharePoint or Microsoft Teams. You then are going to build out your project plan. So document who will need to do what and by when. And this is a, a little snippet example of right hand side here where we can see things like creating a pro sort of a plan for project initiation, um, a kickoff stage, so actually organizing a kickoff to, to sort of um, get everyone up to speed with what's going to happen. Going through a build, actually building out your SharePoint intranet, testing it, and then moving on into more of the migrational kind of phases um, after that. So actually having a plan that everyone's aware of what's going to happen and when and quite often it's really useful if you do have a kind of comms team to actually integrate with them at that point in time as well. So they can start issuing out comms to people so that they know what to expect and by when in terms of where they need to cleanse their documents by when they're going to start creating content for their SharePoint sites. So they know um, so everyone's on the same page of what they need to deliver by when. So there's no nasty surprises. Then you want to create your kind of site map. So a site map essentially, um, we usually have them a little bit more detail, but what this kind of boils down to essentially is what the name of the Microsoft team or SharePoint site is going to be, who the owner is going to be, who the members are going to be, and where, where the current file path of where those documents currently live. So those are the core things that you need to know for your actual migration. So when it comes to then using a, a mapping tool, you can know exactly what's the name of the team that you're going to be migrating to and what, what the file path is going to be when you're moving it across. We're then going to look at creating our intranet. So we engage the relevant parties such as the comms team to build out a nice looking modern looking intranet. Um, and then we sort of are, are probably running in parallel at this point, actually running our cleansing the documents. So I'm going to discuss this in a little bit more in the next stage, but essentially what we're looking at here is creating our plan so we know who's going to do what and when, and we've got a plan of exactly where the documents currently live and where they're going to be moving to. So we're then in a cleansing a folder stage. So this is where we're actually tidying up the documents, the files, the folders that we currently have. Um, so they're ready to migrate and we're not going to have any issues when we come to migrate. Um, so I'll talk a bit about thresholds um, later on, but there's some things that you need to kind of do first and to avoid those particular thresholds. Um, so when we're cleansing our kind of documents, ideally what you want to do before your migration is create a one to one kind of folder um, where on, say for example you're moving from a file server so you would have uh, all your folders of all the kind of teams so say you've got a, you're going to have an IT team a finance team HR team ideally on your on your file server you should also have a folder called IT team finance team HR team to make it easy so it's a one-to-one -one mapping so if I just go back to this area here you'll see then what you should end up with in a file service is departments, human resources, HR team, for example. So we know that the this folder path is exactly what we're going to be migrating into our team. If you end up with loads of links from all over the place and loads of different mappings for, for one individual team, it can get very complicated and you're also increasing the risk that something potentially could go wrong as part of the migration. Um, move only documents you want to migrate to the team named that folder. So leave anything else behind and then you can consider an archiving process of putting that somewhere else. Um, delete all redundant files. So less files means quicker migration. So we don't want to move anything across that we don't actually truly need. We plan to move any personal folders into our OneDrive and we remove any special characters or um, anything that, that doesn't obviously he's gonna, isn't going to play nice in, in, in that kind of sense. We plan for restricted access folders to become private channels within Teams and uh, any linked files uh, will actually break when they're migrated. So we need to consider if there's any key kind of like Excel documents. So by linked documents, I mean like one Excel document which might get its data from 10 other Excel documents, but that's all based on hard coded file paths. And obviously that file path is going to change when we then migrate that into SharePoint or Teams. So we need to plan for that. What are we going to do? Are we going to run that as a separate smaller migration and update them manually? Are we going to look for a tool that's going to update that? you need to have a bit of a plan in place for that. 
Um, keep subfolders as low as possible. So ideally, um, you've probably heard this concept before with sort of websites where people don't want to click more than three times to find their content. So ideally no more than say three to five folders, but really a maximum 10 and you're really pushing the boat out. So try and keep that nice and short. Um, and determine if an archive is possible. So there's certain things you can do with migrational tools where you can do things like only migrate content, which has actually been updated or created within the last two years. So if it's say not been modified for more than two years, you might not necessarily need, need it and you can ignore it and don't move it across. And then you've got this concept of folders versus metadata tags. So inside of SharePoint, what we can do is we can actually create tags. So rather than having folders, which are called things like form, policies, user guides, we can actually create these tags. So we can tag a document with form, policies, user guides, um, and then actually then we can group them. So we can create what we call views. So this is um, a very static way of once you store a document on the forms, it can only live on the forms. Whereas if you tag something and you can multiple tag them, it might be that this one expense request form actually lives under forms, but it also lives under policies as well. So you can actually get it to display in multiple areas. It's a much more flexible way of working. However, the only downside I suppose with the, with the tags, is if you would then sync the documents, um, you don't actually have the, the same kind of structure. It would all just be kind of all one document inside of one document library. So you, you have to weigh the pros, pros and cons against if you're going to be syncing the documents, there needs to be some level of folders to keep that structure. Whereas if you're going to be using them through SharePoint, tags can make a really good flexible way of navigation. So some thresholds um, and things to consider. So SharePoint libraries can hold up to about 30 million files, which sounds great. However, there are some limitations where actually you can only really view up to about 5,000 files at one given time. Otherwise, it's, you start having performance issues and you can get sort of error messages and things like that. So ideally, we want to be able to split out those documents so they're not all just sort of stuck under one kind of place. We can lock down who can create sites to a security group and avoiding a runaway train. So by default, actually anyone can create a Microsoft team, um, which can really end up with a lot of problems where, say, for example, we've seen it before where an organization, someone's created a team called uh, HR team and someone else has created one called human resources team. And then they're wondering why they can't see each other's documents. So what is best to do is lock this down so you create a security group say only these people can create teams and sharepoint sites to prevent that problem from happening and actually consider implementing a request team power app so we've actually built a power app which you can plug directly into um, your kind of microsoft 365 which allows you to request new teams and it goes through an approval process and then will automatically create that team it will then give you a little database of all the teams which kind of exist so people can cross sort of reference that before they actually request to create a new team. Another kind of big issue when um, migrating is this concept of a file path character limitation. So this must not exceed about 400 characters, which sounds like quite a lot, but you'd be surprised that people still can hit that when you've got a lot of kind of um, subfolders um, and things like that. So people sometimes get hung up on this concept of it, it's the amount of subfolders. It's not, it's the amount of characters in total. So just looking at this as a little example down here, you can see this departments, HR, forms, holidays, docx. That actually uh, will transfer into this amount of characters because it's going to have the prefix of the SharePoint site first, and then it will have um, the sort of the folder and the file names afterwards. So it will be slightly longer than what it is in the file path as well. So it's worth taking that into consideration. Um, and you could also, you cannot sync more than 100,000 items. So if you're planning on, on actually moving into SharePoint and Teams to allow people to sync documents offline, maybe they're using them when they have poor internet connectivity or they're traveling on trains or things like that, you want to make sure that they're planning to selectively sync folders. So rather than syncing, say, all of the project folders, just sync one project folder, project X, just sync that one and then mitigate the, the risk of the syncing issues by actually only syncing a certain subsection of files and folders. We can also run migration scans with the free Microsoft tool to identify any issues before migrating. So rather than waiting until the day of the migration and, and running it and realizing you've got all these issues, file path lengths which are too long, special characters, whatever it may be, you can use that tool and run a pre-scan to be sort of given a, a report of any potential issues. 
There's also some free tools as well. So the, there's a link that I'm including at the end, uh, which is just a website online where you can paste in um, some content and it will actually just tell you how many characters there is. So this is a really good way of if you if you think that you've got a file path, uh, which is a bit too long, you can just test it, whack it into this uh, little web page and tell you exactly how many characters are there. So some other considerations as well. So thinking about what equipment and tools you're going to need for running your migration. So the equipment we recommend would be a virtual machine, which has got really good kind of processing power, available memory, and basically just making sure it's a reliable machine. It should it also have access to all the folders to migrate. So you'd be surprised how often we see people attempting these kind of migrations and then realizing the accounts that they've got don't have the full access. Oh, it turns out we don't have access to the finance folders or something like that. You've got to really make sure that you, you've got everything there and triple check that it might be that the, there's folders that you can't see or something like that. So it's worth working with those um, stakeholders that we identified at the beginning of the planning stage to ensure that everything's there and accounted for. Um, you need to make sure that that virtual machine's got fast internet connection uh, and don't use any sort of tools on sort of the file servers directly. So um, it's a potential risk of sort of crashing if they're an old kind of creaking file server. Um, there are third party migrational tools. Um, so there are things like ShareGate, Avepoint, Metalogix, um, and often these are great tools for advanced migrations, but for most migrations, um, actually the free Microsoft tool is more than enough um, to actually do the migrations. It's only really if you've got very sort of advanced permission structures that need to be mapped or something like that, um, or something that, that's very unique, or maybe it's a SharePoint to SharePoint kind of migration that you need to be able to migrate pages of content and not just files as well. And that's when you might be looking at um, some of those third party options. But a lot of these, the, 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 the licenses for these products are quite expensive and you obviously you're only really going to be using them on a one-off so three thousand six thousand pounds purely just for the license for this tool can be quite expensive whereas the free tool for microsoft will cover all of those kind of basis so 10 useful tips um so the tips are based on years of experience at Valto being part of many different approaches and common pitfalls to avoid. So number one is adequate planning. So making sure that you're actually planning out this migration so you know who's going to be doing what and when. Number two is investigate and understand existing content. So actually dive in, take a look, um, figure out what is critical key documents that need to make sure that the the the, the transitions quickly uh, and without any kind of issues uh, and any potential pain points or issues or areas that, that might need to be investigated. Um, number three, decide what is and not important to migrate. So that's what I'm saying is actually determining actually, well, if you can maybe archive a big amount of that document, um, it's going to make the migration process much easier because a lot of people you were looking at migrating potentially um, say on a Friday evening so that when people come in on a Monday morning everything's good to go but if that's a large volume of data you run the risk that it's still not complete by the Monday morning so really you want to be looking at migrating only the sort of the core kind of things that you need to, to do and maybe then if there's things which are documents that people aren't accessing on a daily basis um, and they're more of an archive then you treat that as a sort of second batch of migration. Um, number four create new structures uh, as a chance to improve so as I say treat this as an op op option uh, and um, a way of actually improving efficiency and making things better. Um, agree a migration approach and timelines. So actually making people sort of um, understand what approach you're going for, communicating that clearly uh, and then actually having commitments from people. So often, as I said before, the buy-in stage is so important because you need that commitment from people to actually cleanse their documents and make sure they're ready for from uh, migration. And actually, sometimes people get sort of focused in on this. Oh, I've got to find three weeks or something like that back to back solidly to, to do all of this. Well, actually, no. If you're spacing it out over a longer period of time, a few months, maybe just a commitment of like 30 minutes every Friday that they all sit down with their team and they go through some documents and get rid of the stuff they don't need, move uh, into a folder structure, the stuff they do need, and they just sort of chip away at it um, a little piece by piece. So it's a smaller commitment, uh, but more frequently. Um, and number six, set a budget. So think about the tools, the resources, the training, the adoption, um, everything you kind of need. So understand what that kind of budget is going to be. Um, 
number seven, source sort of professional training. So it's really useful um, to sort of get professional training so you can make sure you get the most out of this. So Valto offer training specifically for uh, IT level admins. So actually understanding SharePoint Admin Center, Teams Admin Center, creating policies and all that sort of stuff. Super user training, so helping people um, who are going to be maybe the sort of representative um, of their department understand how to use this a bit more and end user training as well um, for really simplistic how to get started using Microsoft Teams, for example. Commit internal resources, so get commitment from IT. Um, so what time they're going to be spending on this? How is it going to work? Uh, commitments from heads of departments, even if it's a delegate from their department um, about sort of cleansing documents, that sort of stuff and pilots. So having a pilot group of users who are actually going to sort of uh, try this out. Sometimes organizations will go with like a, a bit of a guinea pig approach where they'll pick on one department first to migrate them and use them as almost like a, a sort of a guinea pig to learn from that, improve the process for next time uh, and almost treat it as a department by department kind of basis rather than this kind of big bang approach of everybody going all at once. Number nine is ongoing support. So having an IT team and Microsoft Microsoft partner there to help if there was any kind of issues or kind of moving into this, how to get the most out of these kind of tools. Um, and also if you've trained your super users, you can have this kind of like structured tiered triage support where end users can go to their sort of super user. So if they've got a super user per department or per team, they can go to them and say, oh, how do I upload this document into teams or something like that? Um, and they can ask them and if they don't know, we also recommend you could have a Microsoft team for super users. So they've got a network internally of other super users they can ask questions to. Um, and if they don't know, then you raise it to the IT support team. Um, and if IT support team don't know, then you raise that to your Microsoft partner, such as Valto, who can step in and bridge any knowledge gaps there might be. Um, and then finally, I'm um, uh, having this migration partner. So it's easier, more secure and more efficient. Um, and it's a similar cost to be honest to those advanced migration tools that we were looking at before to actually engage with a Microsoft partner uh, to help assist with this process. So there's some useful resources here. So if you're interested, we can send out these slides to you afterwards. Um, but here's a link to the sort of free SharePoint migrational tool so you can get started and take a look at that. Um, SharePoint online limits, so all those kind of limitations, thresholds, things like that, that you should be aware of. SharePoint hub sites, so actually planning your SharePoint hub um, and what all the features and things like that do. The online file path counter, so you, if you've got any suspiciously long um, file paths, you can test them. A migration plan example, so that was the kind of the, the SharePoint timeline structures and things that you should be considering and having key dates booked in. And then the site map, which is exactly the list of teams um, that are going to be created and where the files are going to be coming from. So with all of this, Valter do offer file migration workshops, so we can deliver workshops on today's topics, um, which include uh, as part of the workshop, a demonstration of all the products, how to structure SharePoint in teams. Uh, we interview each of the kind of department heads to understand how this is going to work for them, how it's going to benefit them and get their buy in, um, as well as understanding kind of any issues that they currently have for their file structures and that sort of stuff. We create a site map, so what document, what uh, teams exist, what SharePoint sites are going to exist, where the files are going to come from, all that stuff. And then we give you a workshop report of all of our findings um, with a fixed price cost um, of actually delivering that as well. So if you're interested, um, you can email us at hello at valto.co.uk and we can give you more information on that. We do offer other workshops as well. So we've got things like Teams adoptions, SharePoint intranets, modern uh, workplace ways of working, as well as power apps, power platform strategies, and so much more um, with inside the Microsoft 365 uh, stack. So we'll just go now to any sort of Q and A's. Um, so let's have a look. So if you want to drop any questions that you've got into the chat functionality and then we can read them out. One yeah. question that has come up, Dougie, is what's the number one support case that people get once there's been a migration to 365 from a traditional file server? Um, um, I, I suppose one of the things that I, I would often see is um, when things ha have kind of moved or merged um, and the people get concerned that maybe a document has kind of disappeared and this often comes from 
um, sort of poor communication of where maybe two areas have actually merged together. So two teams have merged to become one team um, or potentially even the other way around where something split into two. So something was under one roof and now it's split into two teams and maybe they don't have access to that other team anymore. So it's more of a kind of access and those types of questions that we get around that. Perfect. OK, um, the next one is, do you recommend the use of third party products? or other free tools that Microsoft provide good enough to do a migration? So uh, it, it's one of those things where if, if if you've got a very advanced sort of situation where, say for example, like a tool like ShareGate, where if you're, you're very uh, concerned about the permission structures of your files, um, you could use something like ShareGate where, let's say for example, all of the previous files on folders, maybe Joe Bloggs had access to them, but now he's left the organization and his uh, replacement is now Ted Jones. ShareGate will actually allow you to migrate documents and say anywhere that you found Joe Bloggs was the owner of these documents or had access to these documents, you can actually say it's now Ted Jones. So you can give him the access. So if there's very custom unique scenarios like that, Sometimes it's worth kind of considering those third parties, or as I say, if it's a SharePoint to SharePoint migration, so you're going from uh, a classic or on-premise version of SharePoint directly to SharePoint Online. Again, think about those third-party tools. But for a lot of the migrations that we run, which is purely just documents, um, and we're trying to keep it sort of super simple, the out-of-the-box kind of Microsoft tools are more than adequate. Okay. Um, another question: That is any. Um, uh, throttling from Microsoft on uploading large amounts of data. So I, I think that there is a throttling roughly uh, averages about a terabyte per day or something along those kind of lines. Um, so if, if you've got very large amounts of data, it's worth considering actually breaking them down into smaller batches. And in fact, actually a lot of the migrational tools will allow you to create um, almost like mapping files so you can say okay well this is this particular batch this is this particular batch and you can even schedule them as well um, to, to, to run sort of independently so yeah from a throttling perspective um, if you worked on the basis of about a terabyte per day um, as a kind of maximum um, that will roughly give you a rule of thumb. Um, Great the other one is how does a free migration tool deal with users that already have files on their home drives and in OneDrive directly? If there's an issue that has the file has the same name. So the, the SharePoint migration tool or migration manager is really flexible. You can decide whether to overwrite a file that has the same name and that can then create a second version of it. The other thing you can do is ask it to not move files that have got a modified date that's older than the OneDrive location. Uh, so there's some flexibility around that and you're also able to to map out spreadsheets and stuff. So if you've got a more complicated scenario for your migration, you're able to create a spreadsheet that maps those files and moves them over in a more structured way where you potentially don't want to overwrite files or have a conflict. So we would look to do that. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Um, do we have any other questions? Yeah. Is it critical to have sensitivity labels to document to ensure sensitive or critical data is not shared accidentally or incorrectly? So I guess the major benefit of Microsoft 365 is that it's more open. So one of the complexities with file servers previously is you would want to say, right, I want to give access to a director just to this folder within finance, but they don't need to have access to any of the other locations. So we end up with very complicated folder structures and permissions, and it's often then the IT team that have to try and figure out the best way to do that. And it ends up in a mess of, of who's looking after those. So one of the great features that we get with um, 365 is this ad hoc sharing capability, which means that IT don't have to worry too much now about figuring out how to do those sharing, and the user can then start to share things themselves. What that of course does though is open up a window then. So what we, we don't want is a user sharing files that they shouldn't. So a HR team perhaps shouldn't share a contract externally. So it gives us that capability of being able to um, basically use things like sensitivity labels to classify a document to say this is HR only. And therefore if a user tries to share something that they shouldn't, 
by accident or maliciously, then that sensitivity label will kick in. And even if a, a, a folder has been shared with someone outside of the HR team, if they try and open an employment contract, the sensitivity label will kick in and say you don't have access to be able to do that. So it's kind of it's layering your security. The first layer is opening up that ability to allow people to start to share files. And then the second one is adding that sensitivity as an extra barrier, a new level of protecting things um, that, that shouldn't be shared externally or even internally as well. Brilliant. Um, I think that's all of our questions actually. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining everybody. We'll look to be having another webinar soon, which will be around 365 compliance. It's one we've done for a few of our um, local authority police sectors. We did a, a similar webinar directly for those guys. So we're looking to do that as part of one of our new webinars moving forward. Uh, we've also had some quite exciting news. So Valto has um, basically expanded out. We've looked, we've just recently launched a new office. So it's a great modern office that's been opened up in Chester and we're going to start to look to do some physical events again and maybe try and get some of the people who've been joining our webinars to come to our offices do some face-to-face -face events and it'd be great to kind of see people again so thank you very much yeah. everybody for joining today I don't know if you've got anything to add Dougie no that's it thank you very much for your time great cheers all cheers. bye